Greetings to each and every one of you. I believe that this study of Colossians are helping us to draw us more closer to God and to experience the new life that Christ has promised for us. Last week we looked at the imagery of putting off and putting on. And today we're going to continue in the same theme and where Paul is exhorting the church to continue living in the ethics of the new creation. He is challenging the people not to be imitators of their past life again in the new life, but to change their view. Just like what metanoia, transformation means, repentance means to turn back and to go under God and to be in likeness of his creation, the true humanity that God wanted us to be in the original creation. So Paul echoes these words in his writings and in his uh, message to the people at Colossae and we are able to read this today and understand as a part of a message even to us to put off the old self, get rid of the past and to move forward in the way that God wants each of us to be. Today we're going to look at Colossians chapter 3 verses 11 to 17. And I would like to call it as putting on the new self. Now here, what we understand, especially in verse 11, is Paul spoke in the earlier verses of the new identity, the new self that has been created. And through the atonement and works of Christ, we are able to analyze that there is a new person that has come, a new creation that is existing. However, the new person is not limited to his own well-being in the uh, spiritual aspect or in the new creation. In the new creation, God expects us to be part of the new humanity. In the beautiful commentary that is written by John Stott on Ephesians, he denotes and he separates the entire letter itself as one who is in new life, has to be in a new relationship and he has to be in a new society and they have to conduct themselves in a new standard. And we see a similar message even here in Colossians where Paul is saying that one who is born again, a life that has been uh, renewed in Christ, the new person is not alone and standing lonely at one side, but he is becoming part of the community of God. He is part of the covenant of God. In Paul's understanding, the local church and the universal church plays a very vital role in the significance and transformation of a person. In fact, we see in Paul a, a form of mission where he is going and starting churches at places where there were no churches. And this was because he understood the need and essentiality of people who follow Christ to come together. And this coming together and this understanding of a fellowship is going to help in their spiritual walk with Christ. Now here the renewal in Christ is not limited to an individual change of character. It is not just one person being changed, but it is also about a corporate recreation of humanity in the creator's image. Now the fulfillment, the accomplishment and the consummation of this will come in the day of the Lord. However, with the inauguration of the kingdom of God, Christ has already started in him the new community and we are all part of it by his grace. And the Holy Spirit becomes the identity, the way that we see or we enter this beautiful community of God is by the mark of the Spirit upon our lives. Paul here is mentioning about different pairs of matters that is arranged in a particular format to in a way show the contrasting pattern. Verse 11, here there is no Gentile or Jew circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, syndican, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. 
Now here we see that most of these words are familiar to a Pauline audience. When we read Paul's other letters, he constantly uses the phrases Gentile and Jew. We see that in Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and so on. We also see in Paul the verses uh, slave and free being used in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Galatians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 6. Though circumcision and uncircumcision are not very together seen always, we see that picture in Galatians chapter 5 and 6. Now, the, the list that is standing out over here is the aspect of barbarian and Scythian. And Paul uses this former elsewhere, but never has been contrasted. Now, this is the only place where we see that this particular aspects of both these barbarian and Scythian have been uh, contrasted with each other. Now, we understand this to be two class, two societies, uh, which are probably in contradiction with one another. Now, those who belong to Christ are belonging to a new humanity in Christ. Now, they are distinct from the world. Their identity is not set in the world. They are beyond this world because they are living a heavenly minded lifestyle, even as a community. Now, after this session, we see the household code that Paul is mentioning from chapter 3, verses 18 to chapter 4, verses 1, which shows the importance. Though there is difference of roles and difference in people, and that difference have to be cherished. But however, even though there are differences, even though there are diversities, we are seeing that in Christ, everybody is one. There is a unity that Christ has set for his people. Now we see that Jews are still Jews in Christ. Gentiles still remain as Gentiles in Christ. Slaves are still slaves. And also masters probably remain as masters. But the way that they look at their roles and define their roles completely changes that once they are in Christ. When we look at the household codes, we'll be able to understand the way Paul is dictating on how the master and slave becomes brother in Christ and how the husband and wife have to submit to each other and live in oneness, love and unity. And in this, we see the beauty of God's creation. God has not called us to be individualistic, minded, self-centered people, but he has called us to be focusing on our church and local church attendance is very vital in our discipleship life. If any of you who hears me are in any ways confused about churches and are not part of them because of various reasons, maybe valid reasons, but understand that it is necessary for your spiritual growth to be part of a Bible centered church and this would help you in every aspect of your life. Also, understand that churches that are far away from the Bible can be a hindrance to your spiritual life as well. So Paul here moves to verses 12 to 14 where he changes that negative light of putting off the sins before verse 11 to a positive life of putting on the various nature. And here we see the beautiful words that Paul has used to define this new humanity. Even though this can be identified as individualistic aspects on how they are chosen, they are holy, they are dearly loved, it is also understood in a corporate aspect or it has to be more understood in a church setting because in them, together when they dwell in unity, we see the chosen ones, the elected ones of God, representing God in this generation. Now here we see that Christians who are asked to abandon the old ways of life are not asked to just leave it out there like that, but they have to embrace new ways. Let me read for you verses 12 to 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, 
kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And overall, these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now here we see in God's new humanity the character, the ethics that have to be defined. The church which is like Israel who has become the representative of God has to transfer, has to show the world the ethics that Christ has dictated to them. Christ has shown them through his life and now they have to put on these very nature and they have to embrace these natures in Christ. Now Paul particularly uses the word chosen people, holy people and dearly loved. Now we understand that chosen was a word again that was used for Israel as, their, as God's covenant people. Now Paul is stating that the chosen realm is not limited to the people of Israel but is extended beyond boundaries where people of all classes beyond their ethnicity, beyond their gender, beyond their cultural differences can together be part of this nature because they are God's chosen people. Now because they are God's chosen people, they have to be holy people. Now the understanding of holy or agios is the understanding that they are set apart. Now the understanding of being set apart comes from the Old Testament usage of this phrase in the light of the temple where the elements of the temple were set apart only for the functions of the temple. And similarly, Christians who are called, who are chosen, elected by God are clearly asked by God to be set apart for him. Now they are not to mingle with the world and to be transformed in the worldly likeness but they have to depend on God and live in his likeness and be set apart for him. Holiness is not limited to external appearances and external aspects. Yes, our internal holiness will flow out into external deeds. We will have to be modest. We will have to talk in similar ways. We will have to do certain things in a particular way. However, unless our inner man has been transformed, unless our inner man has been changed, there is no point in whatever external changes that we make in our Christian life. And hence here we see that picture where we are set apart as Christians in Christ. And also it says that we are dearly loved. And for a Christian, when he thinks about the love of Christ, he can never forget to run back to the cross of Christ. Where in Christ we see the beautiful work of God where he gave up his own son for the mankind so that their sins and their nature of death can be released and they can be free from the sin and the death and they can live a free life or they can live a life that is under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And this is the aspect of true love dearly loved people and because they are dearly loved they have to embrace this new nature the new ethics the new way of life that Christ has put for his people so whatever our worldly background or status we have a fundamental identity now that is determined by Christ and the people of Christ to whom we belong but this new identity while given in Christ must be achieved in the practice in our daily life this sort of a new identity has to come into life now the barriers that have been put up by the world must, must be overcome in reality as we live out the new relationship in the body of Christ and hence Paul here implies that this new self is rooted in history. 
the Christians in Colossae, who were probably Gentiles, have had the privilege here to be alongside with the historical people of God, the new self or the new Israel, where they are becoming part of God's chosen people. Now, this identification is clearly indicated when Paul says that you are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. All these are standard ways of describing Israel in the Old Testament and now the church as the people of God in the New Testament. The governing concept, the idea that stands out over here is chosen people, the ones who are elected by God and they have to be holy and they are dearly loved by God. Paul earlier spoke about putting off the clothes, putting off what was shabby in nature, dirty in its nature. They are not accustomed to such finery, but here God's loving and his gracious choice helps them to be fitting into this new robes where they will be able to demonstrate the character of Christ. Paul here again is using that clothing imagery that he has employed earlier, which is putting again the emphasis on the people of God, on his listeners to emphasize, to cultivate the virtues in Christ rather than to uh, go back into the old ways of life. Paul here demonstrates various characters that comes as their identification in the new covenant. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Compassion, here translated as a phrase which in Old English can be understood from bowels of mercy. It is translated from the Greek splankana, which literally means bowels, which makes an English reader clear that the physiological sense referring to the inner parts of a person, that the compassion and the mercy should flow from within of a person. Bowels were very often associated with emotion and especially love. And this we see in the letter that Paul wrote to Philemon, where he was speaking about the love that they dearly shared. Now here, when Paul speaks about compassion, he mentions about the love that is characterized by mercy or a heartfelt compassion, which is demonstrated to the people in the community. The second one, kindness, it is about the attitude of God's own goodness because of God's gracious heart. He was kind towards us and he forgave us and made us his covenant people. The third aspect is the call to humility. And here in the New Testament, we see the understanding of humbling, where in Philippians chapter 2, we see Christ's attitude of humbling himself, where Christ taking on the human form and going to the cross on our behalf where we see Christ as a perfect figure for humility and then comes gentleness and it is defined as the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance and finally patience it is an attitude that both the God the Father and Christ has displayed to the sinful creatures and as his people, we are called to display this character to the people of this world. The final garment to be put on is love, which is going to hold every other aspect together. And when in love one stands, we are able to define in Christ to love our people. In verses 15 to 17, we see the peace of Christ. Let's read those verses. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The peace 
which is to characterize the church is not a mere outward absence of hostility. It is not lack of having issues, but it is more of the peace of Christ to be the deciding factor, which is to be the umpire of the game, where the peace of Christ has to rule in the life of the community. Now there would be disagreement because they are different people coming from different backgrounds, having different ways of thoughts and different mindset. And even in disagreements, they should have the peace in Christ. Even while they express their views, they should be able to stand together and love each other and attribute all the characters that we mentioned before and showcase that they are part of the new creation. The vision of the church's life prompts Paul to add once more, to be thankful. Now love, peace and gratitude is reinforced here. And this will set the context for what exhortations Paul wants to bring forth in the coming verses. The gospel is inescapably individual. Now we cannot miss the aspect of we ourselves declaring the Lordship of Christ and having accepting Christ into our life. We cannot miss a lot of disciplines that we as individuals in the new covenant have to keep. However, we cannot forget the community life in Christ. We have to forget that gospel is also inescapably corporate just as it is inescapably individualistic. We are called along with other people with whom we make up one body, the imagery that Christ uses for his church. The ministry of admonishing and teaching is to be a part of a life of thankfulness that overflows into a song. Admonishing and teaching are primary importance in the church settings. Unless we teach the word of God, unless we teach the doctrines, unless theology is properly communicated to, to the community, they would be tossed by the different teachings that is coming their ways. And hence Paul is encouraging the church to teach and admonish them. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Here we see the importance of teaching and admonishing because the way that we understand Christ more, the way we know Christ more is through the ministry of teaching. Now that should overflow. The beautiful exposition of God's word should flow into a doxology of psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude towards what God has done in our life. The three different categories of song in this verses in the context are not very easy to distinguish. Older writers suggested that Psalms were probably accompanied by songs being a more general word for hymns and is uh, qualified with the adjective spiritual to distinguish it from the secular sort of a singing. However, Psalms may be seen as the Christian use of the Old Testament Psalms. Paul concludes this message in verse 17 with a marker saying that whatever you do, whether in deed or in word, do it all for the Lord Jesus Christ. Acting in someone's name in the context is representing him and being empowered by him to do so. And Paul's exhortation is therefore a salutary check here on the behavior. If I am doing something, on whose behalf am I doing it? Paul here is suggesting that the ethics is not limited to a church life, but the ethic is flowing towards every aspect of our life. The Christian life should be spread throughout our life and we should reflect the character of Christ in everything that we do. And finally, Paul again adds the message to give thanks to God the Father through him. Let us live a life in gratitude with what Christ has done for us. What we have learned today is about the importance of community life. 
not to be focused by the individualistic nature of the today's Western theologies, but to live in such a light that we are focused also on the community and we value our brethren just as we value us and our own families. And also to put on the new self, the ethics and the character that will distinguish us from the old self and the new self have to be put on the language that Paul is often using in his letter. And finally, the ministry of the church should be strongly rooted in teaching and admonishing and the teachings and the expositions of God's word should lead us into the doxology of praising and thanking God for his amazing being. And finally, Paul here is stating, whatever we do, do it all for the glory of God. May God help us to do everything that we do for God's glory. Mm -hmm.